All right, I want to start the session, so please go and find your seats uh, and lower your voices so that we can make a start. I know this is not an easy thing to do after lunch on the Friday, and particularly not after this uh, spectacular visit to Zoomarine we had yesterday with lots of uh, um, uh, good food and wine and definitely a great band. Um, I saw some of the speakers in this session today late on the dance floor, so um, fingers crossed this is going to all get the energy it needs, but I'm sure they will be, will be excellent. <clears throat> okay, so this is a session that um, exists uh, of two parts. The first part of this session is, is a panel discussion, um, which is focused on the future of zoos and aquaria. Uh, it's a broader discussion, so it's, it's clear, uh, important to say that that's not only going to focus on the keeping of cetaceans, cetaceans or marine mammals, it's, it's zoos and aquariums in a general context. Uh, and we're really pleased uh, to have um, Ana Daniela Suarez Ferreira, I hope I pronounced that in the right way, um, with us to lead that panel discussion with several panelists. Um, Anna is a journalist at uh, Radio and Television Portugal and is quite, uh, quite well known, so we're really pleased uh, that she will take over the stage after the first hour. The first hour is going to zoom in to the, to the um, keeping and management of marine mammals. We are uh, obviously in Zoo Marine, there are marine mammals held. Um, there's uh, definitely in, in relation to the, the, the keeping of animals in zoos and aquariums. There's focus on, on uh, marine mammals, on elephants, on felids, on, on fish, so it's much broader. But we are here now today and we have the excellent opportunity to also showcase lots of the work that has been done by uh, the marine mammal tech and also members of that tech at their institution in relation to the care uh, and management and welfare of these, um, these, these species under the marine mammal definition and also research and education related work that is going on. So the first hour, um, we have five speakers that are going to come with different focuses and examples uh, on marine mammal management uh, and keeping. And the first speaker uh, is Claudia Gilli uh, on behalf of Parque Natura Viva, but also uh, our um, uh, chair of the IASA Marine Mammal Tech. Uh, Claudia was going to do a duo act uh, together with Robert Cosceta, the EP coordinator for the Dolphin Act, but he uh, had to, uh, couldn't make it because of he's, not, he's not feeling well. So Claudia is going to uh, do an act uh, all by herself and do both parts. Um, so Claudia, if you can come to the stage and give your speech. Good afternoon, friends and colleagues. Uh, I will present today the, the Marine Mammal Tag, past, present and future and basically all the achievements, the challenges, and all the work that has been done since I've been involved in this tag. Um, starting from the history of the tag, it was basically funded in 1992 at the NEASA meeting in Innsbruck. At the time, the meetings were with 60 people, and, uh, and right now we're tenfold more than this and more and more. And uh, it was uh, in the spring, and the tag was started by Berthe Bohr, the uh, former executive director, and Gerard Mayer, who's actually not been able to participate and saying hello to all the people that he knows. The first programs were uh, California Sea Lion, which was actually basically an overlap of the ESB of the Dutch uh, Stadtbook, together with Amper and the bottlenose dolphin EP. It started at that time with Matt Samundin, and the reason behind this choice was that uh, Cole Marden had a very strong relationship with, the, with the, the holders of the dolphins, and therefore he would have been a researcher, scientist, and representative for the species. Very difficult time for the bottlenose dolphin at that point. The organization right now, uh, Gerard left in 2017, September, and I became tech chair, and Agustin uh, Lopez Goya is our vice chair. He also wasn't able to come, and he's sending greetings to all of you. And then we have eight uh, program coordinators. 
three veterinary advisors. Daniel Garcia Paraga is uh, the tag advisor and he will be speaking after me. And then we have Katrin Baumgartner for the manatees and Kirsten Sterner for the pinnipeds. And then we have a liaison with the IWAM for the accreditation committee, another veterinarian, Tania Monreal. Numerous collaborations in place, but the most important thing for the moment, I would say, is the MOU with the IWAM that has been long going. We started it when I was still in the board of the IWAM in 2009. And uh, it's an MOU, we're just about to renew it right now. And uh, it's basically concentrating on the management of the animals under human care. And uh, towards conservation, on the contrary, we have collaborations with other groups and associations. Very important, the one with MOM, which is uh, dedicated to, uh, is the Hellenic uh, Society for the Study and Protection of Monacus Monacus, which is the monk seal, European monk seal, the most endangered marine mammal in the, in the uh, Eaza region. And uh, then we have uh, Yakupacha. Uh, it's an organization that is dedicated to the conservation of Latin American species and has been ongoing since 2016. And then ex situ options. It was born in Nuremberg in 2018, in November during a conference. And now it's growing and growing and you will see why. The achievements still, I mean, we have had a, a regional collection plan ongoing uh, since 2017. Uh, at the time, we only had four uh, programs, the dolphins, the manatee, California sea lion, and the gray seal. And in 2017, we included a lot more species that you can see here uh, mentioned, including some monitored by a person and some monitored by the tag. Uh, but now we completed, and I must thank the EASA office for this because Meryl has been a great help together with Danny in getting us, in pushing us to get this done and completed. But we have a big change, an increasing number of programs. Right now uh, we have eight EEPs. Uh, first Seals are uh, one of the old uh, programs that were split. We decided to put it together. And then uh, the big um, the big news is that uh, for the first time we have a, a species that is not maintained under human care, but the human care knowledge and capabilities are actually, uh, can actually be a great help in the conservation of the species, which is Tursiops truncatus gephirius, lightly bottlenose dolphin. And then a great load of monitoring programs. Uh, all of them are basically uh, monitored by the TAG. Five of them are species that are already under human care, and, uh, and uh, all the others uh, are um, monitored uh, by the tag, but do not obtain species. Uh, with one exception, which is the harbor seal, uh, the harbor porpoise, sorry, Focena Focena, uh, that might end up in the facility of one of us uh, for uh, rescue purposes. And then, for the first time, we included uh, uh, monitored by the tag, still do not obtain, eight species from the ESOC group and four species that inhabit uh, naturally the waters of uh, Mediterranean Sea, Atlantic, and around the European region. And these are for research purposes. Documents. Uh, we have completed numerous documents, uh, some of them quite challenging for the, for the statements that are including, in, uh, that, that are, uh, um, for the statements um, that are uh, drawn. Uh, we have the Tursiops truncatus long-term management plan that has been ongoing since 2016, and now we have a plan to release a new one uh, with the new EEP programs uh, by the end of next year. Uh, the Tours of Struncatus Start Book has been an issue for many years because the data was not published for numerous reasons, and now it is available for uh, whoever wants to ask uh, for information about uh, this species. Uh, we have Manatee Best Practice Guidelines, Pinniped Best Practice Guidelines, EASA Demonstration Guidelines that was uh, prepared together with the IAAM within the MOU. 
a statement on dolphin contraception, a statement on pinniped tuberculosis management, which has been recognized by the uh, European Association of Zoo and Wildlife Vets, and is on their website, is published on their website. And for this reason, I really tell you, I'm pretty sure you appreciated yesterday the, the, the afternoon session where I was shown all the medical behaviors and the husbandry training that people can do with the, with the dolphins, but also with the pinnipeds. And this is a strength for the marine mammal tag because it is a technique that uh, it can be utilized for research, can be utilized for education, for conservation. So it's really an asset that can be uh, utilized and, and, and particular for this type of tag. Nevertheless, there are some challenges, and these challenges are uh, the fact that many pinnipeds are still maintained in facilities that are sort of substandard for one reason or the other. So we are planning to update the, be the best practice guidelines, including some specificities that are lacking in the current version, and uh, make sure that people understand and uh, appreciate the, the importance of the, their management in proper conditions. And one of them is the TB management for otterids, which is very important and needs a lot of uh, uh, veterinary care, uh, proper quarantine, diagnostics, hygiene, as well as proper LSS systems, and uh, why not marine, so, uh, marine water, which is also a help for mycobacteria containment. We need to promote long-term management of numerous species, and uh, I must say that the tag is not uh, uh, very much in favor of culling uh, young pups or youngsters uh, just for exhibit purposes. So I think this is an opportunity for us to share this thought with you and talk about it. So think about long-term management for each one of the species. And then the, the other big challenge is the lack of space for cetaceans and uh, the need of long-term contraception in many cases which is going to be addressed also in the new, next best practice guidelines. So in conclusion, the goals of this tag is, are actually to be able to apply the same standards for all the facilities, both inside the Asda region and outside, and uh, disseminate the correct information about the species. Marine mammals are very expensive species. They need adequate space, they need adequate adequate uh, resources and adequate staff, very highly qualified. We saw yesterday examples of trainers and veterinarians and staff, researchers, educators, people that uh, are really keen and dedicated to, to have the programs working. And uh, they need proper space. For the moment, the best practice guidelines only include the space minimum standards. So the larger, the better all the time and a life support system that needs to be dedicated and studied on purpose. Um, we need to promote animal moves between countries within the, within the EASA region, and which doesn't occur very much as a problem, but outside the EASA region, uh, promote exchanges that avoid commercial operations, and, uh, and basically address all the legislative issues that are currently uh, being proposed uh, as, a, as a normative changes in the different countries in Europe and in other regions of the world. And uh, without further ado, I, I would like to introduce the following uh, presentation because unfortunately, as Denis said, Robert is not, uh, is not feeling very well, so I will speak on his behalf. He has been the coordinator of the EEP, uh, of Tursiops truncatus EEP, uh, bottlenose dolphin, since 2017. And he's basically taking over from the people that uh, ran the program before then. The program, as I said, started with Matsyamund in, in 1992. But at the time, it was really a big challenge because there was uh, some sort of uh, difficult relationship between the EASA members and the EAAM members and those solitary members that ho were dolphin holders but not part of any association and there was some sort of suspicion between the, the, the different groups of people. 
So uh, a lot of work has been done. Uh, the MOU has been an asset for this to happen. And uh, as you can see, when the, uh, for this to happen and have uh, the animals being managed in one group. And as, as you can see, the arrow shows where the program started in 1992 and the increase of population uh, is, is, is very evident by the graph. I must say the population that was, we had many difficulties with breeding the species, keeping the, the animals, uh, the calves alive, uh, fear of uh, hands-on procedures that were actually the way to change uh, uh, this graph into a growth, together with the lifting bottoms and the hands-on uh, with the calves. And uh, this is the situation at the moment. We have 255 animals, slightly more males. 81% uh, of the population is uh, captive born already. The last uh, wild caught were in 2003, so almost 20 years ago. But definitely the population is democratically and genetically self-sustainable. Challenges. We have a slight increase in number of males, which unfortunately belong to a species that cannot be held one to one. So, held one to one. So, uh, the males need bachelor groups in different uh, locations. The population management, unfortunately, uh, some of the current holders are uh, are being are phasing out, and there's no request at the moment in the Asa region for new holders. Uh, there is a strong opposition from the NGOs and uh, some countries are actually at the moment evaluating a change against citations under human care. But a lot of work has been done. I mean, the start book, the start book is available to all of you for all the members and is published in Zims. It will be published in 2023 and uh, the coordinator, if it was Robert sitting here, he would be telling you that he was personally involved in a lot of these activities. I mean, the relocation of animals from closing facilities, the actual moves of the animals on the plane, by truck, whatever. And uh, another activity that takes a daily routine is support and provide correct information to the governments that ask for when they are addressing the legislation changes and they only get information from the NGOs. And many times this information is incorrect. Like France that was thinking that we were breeding dolphins in order to sell them at a great price in other countries. So those things need to be stopped. This information very often is not uh, in line with what we are actually doing as a tag and as a community, Marimemo community. And as I said, in 2023, we're also producing the new best practice guidelines. So which are the current goals for this EEP is basically to promote welfare research because welfare research is a tool that can actually guarantee high management standards. We need uh, new holders within Europe or outside. Otherwise, we will have to face a population reduction. But we might probably need to reconceive and utilize new concepts for uh, the design of exhibits and the design of the, the way we show dolphins to the public. Bottlenose dolphins are definitely models, can be research models, but are definitely models for husbandry training, for research, for conservation activities, and are really proving to be an example and can be an example for other species under human care. So thank you very much. If, if any one of you wants to contact either me or Robert, this is the email, or you can find it in the ASA. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Claudia, for, uh, for that presentation and the, and the duo act, and also for sticking to time perfectly. We have a busy session. Um, I still remember the discussions that were going on in Wroclaw during the council meeting and during the participants at the time where there was a lot of emphasis coming out of that meeting saying we need to make sure that, that we look at the ma management of marine mammals uh, in the same way as we do for any other tag. Uh, and it is really amazing to see so much positive progress being made in the last year, so congratulations Claudia.
Uh, quickly moving on to the next speaker, uh, Daniel Garcia Paraga from uh, Oceanographic in Valencia, who is going to still have a focus on marine uh, species, marine mammals, but look at it from an individual institutional perspective and, and how you can address a welfare strategy. Daniel. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much, Danny, and the organization for inviting me to present a, our strategy on welfare that actually has been greatly motivated because we do keep marine mammals and including some cetaceans like belugas or dolphins that certainly raise a lot of concern in activism and, and politicians. So we found that it was important to, to develop a strong strategy for ourselves to regulate our activities, but also to be able to provide evidence of the good welfare that the animals were uh, uh, living. So for this work, uh, we basically, it was a collaborative work of our team at the Oceanographic and the team at the University Autonomous of Barcelona, led basically by uh, Xavier Manteca Villanova who is actually a boarded certified expert on animal welfare at the uh, European Board of Veterinary Specialization. So basically, uh, we understand and, and that welfare should be the driving force for all the policies in a, in a zoo or an aquarium. Without the welfare part, all the rest of the activities are difficultly, very difficultly uh, justified. I think we put many times the focus in conservation goals, in, in the education, in the research, in the outreach, in institute programs, and sometimes because we know that our animals are, are, are in good welfare, we don't explain and we don't uh, enhance uh, the, the value of guaranteeing this welfare, and not only that, but proving and actually providing evidence that the animals are in good care. So research, and we do a lot of that, is actually very important, but it's very, very important also that we move the discussion from welfare, from the opinion into facts or into science. And this is one of the uh, strongest parts of having a, a strategy on welfare that actually we can uh, collect uh, and support uh, with facts, with actual indicators, and demonstrate that our animals are, are living a life that is worth living. So basically, the whole strategy is uh, based on the, on the five uh, dimensions of, of Mellor model. And I really like this diagram from 2020 because it's unfold the behavioral domain in interactions with the environment, interactions with other animals, and interactions with humans. And specifically for the, for the marine mammal care, uh, we understand that there are some uh, weaknesses, like the environment they live at, at, at some times, that is typically, in, it's true that for cetaceans in particular, in some pinnipeds, the facilities are perceived like kind, kind of poor compared with uh, terrestrial facilities. And that's something that we are trying to address also in our program with multi-specific facilities also for marine mammals. However, as, as Claudia was mentioning, the health part, uh, thanks to the, the collaboration of the animals through training, is something that we can be proud of and we can really, really deliver a high level of medicine in, in these taxons. On the other side, I think it's very important to include in our policies, specifically with marine mammals, this animal-human uh, interaction. The trainers has a huge impact uh, uh, on, on the animal welfare. So it's very, very, for the good or for the bad. So it's very, very important that we are also able to, to evaluate that. This is, for instance, one of the new facilities we have for seals, where we keep them with puffins, with fish, with invertebrates. And I think this is, in many aspects, the way to go. No? I mean, uh, typically, uh, has been like one species per tank, and we are trying to do in the multiple way. On the other side, as we were mentioning, the, the, the clinical care that we can provide through training, it's, it's amazing, it's the same as the research, and the human-animal bond is absolutely critical. So for the strategy, I think most of us has been working on welfare for many years. Uh, and in our case, what we didn't have is a written policy regarding that, where I think it's very, very important to have it written with certain goals that we can evaluate. Of course, to assign a budget to guarantee is going to be implemented, involving the whole structure of the company from, from the General, the, the general director, to people in biology, to people in shops, in restaurants, everybody should be aware of the policy and what the institution is doing for the welfare of the animals. 
And I think also it's very strategic to include people from outside, including external experts. I think they can really, really give an outside vision that sometimes we cannot detect when we are inside. And also it works for the credibility and transparency of the program. So we conceive the program in different layers. We, everything starts with the daily care that we provide to the animals, the, the keepers of the aquarist in the, in the aquarium. And around that, we have all the different programs that of course are policies that should be also in written and basically recording and registering the information to provide the evidence that we also want for the monitoring. So from training, the veterinary program, nutrition, enrichment, facility design, the continuing education program for our staff, that's what guarantees that the program will be rolling and will be updated. On the top of that, we created the position of an animal welfare officer. We, we understood in our case it's an external, it's from the university, it could be an internal, but it's somebody in charge, which we think is very important. On the top of that, we have an internal audit system on animal welfare that we will describe a little bit farther on. And on the top of that, we have the external accreditation programs for different institutions. So it's very different layers to guarantee or to protect the animal welfare. And again, I think most of us, we are already doing it, but having it written and structured, I think it's very, very important. So the animal welfare officer in our case, it has three main functions. On one side is supervision of the welfare of the animals, uh, doing some audits in the aquarium, I mean, supervising the enrichment programs, uh, of course, supervising the research activity. On the other side, the training and advice of our staff. So the animal welfare officers give courses, after courses, uh, active courses to, to our people on how they should be doing enrichment or how to take better records and not just in the biology department, but also in other departments at the aquarium and research. We also have active research lines on validating indicators of welfare. How can we actually measure and scientifically evidence that the animal is in good welfare? Regarding our internal audit system, we have an animal care and welfare committee that is composed by 10 members from the institution and five members from outside, from different universities and research centers close to us. Another, I think, quite interesting step was implementing a whistleblow policy that any employee at the aquarium could anonymously raise a concern regarding welfare without having to report to me in the biology department or sometimes people is uh, scared to talk. And I think given the way that anybody can raise a concern and this concern needs to be addressed in the animal care and welfare committee. It's not something that I can stop from the uh, animal department. And the last step will be the, the specific tool for periodic standardized welfare assessment. So we de develop our own tool for routine examinations on the, on the welfare status of the different facilities. But that's, the program is much more than a monitoring tool for welfare for the animals. So any activity involving live animals do need to be tested and supervised at some point by the Animal Care and Welfare Committee. And of course, we are working, as Claudia was mentioning also, at the EWM on a specific tool for a specific species, like in this case, the bottlenose dolphins, to actually be able to measure welfare more particularly in certain individuals or certain species. And of course, uh, on the, the outer layer will be the uh, outside accreditation programs from more generic ones in the management system for the aquarium to more more uh, particular ones on zoological associations or animal accreditation uh, on welfare programs. So four take home points, we understand that all modern zoos and aquariums should have a specific animal welfare strategy according to their collection, of course, big zoos will have a strategy that could be very different for small zoos, but I think having something written is very important. And this is important basically because uh, it provides protection for what it can comes from the outside and can provide hand help to provide evidence and can uh, actually facilitate to move in the right direction. Basically, it's, it's like showing the way. On the other side, we need to be ready to uh, implement it with some res additional resources, some money, but especially some time and human resources. It's time consuming and it's a little bit more of effort, but it's really worth it. And to finalize the appointment of animal welfare officer and the creation of animal care and welfare committee that actually includes experts from outside, 
we thought is very particularly valuable. It's, uh, the, the decision making is not relying in one person, or like in my case, like the head of the biology department. It's actually a committee that is supervising that with people from outside, which is take pressure out of me and actually serves to be constantly updated and certainly works for transparency and credibility towards NGOs or governments. Thank you very much, and if you have any questions, I will be happy to answer later on. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Daniel. Excellent uh, presentation. Also some key, uh, key messages there in the conclusions at the end. Uh, for those of us that were in the uh, workshop on uh, the future of accreditation, you will also have heard that the Membership and Ethics Committee is also looking into requirements for the membership into the future to do these type of welfare assessments, obviously to the scale and needs of, of your collection uh, and, and your institution. So yeah, this is really, really excellent as, a, as an example to see. Um, right, we're moving on uh, into the more research conservation area and the next speaker is Lorenzo van Versen from Tierpark. Nuremberg and also the Manatee EP coordinator uh, and Lorenzo will talk about uh, dolphins in mother zoos as a model for integrated species conservation. Lorenzo. Thank you Daniel. Uh, good afternoon everyone and thank you very much also to Zoomerin for the last night and also for organizing this wonderful meeting. So I will be talking about um, the role a zoos and aquarium can play in conservation of small cetaceans. And, um, and I'm not talking about all the options that we might have. I think it's more important to talk about the need to get involved in this conservation procedure. And I will start the first, uh, okay. And I will start telling you that we have 46% of all species, subspecies and subpopulations that are threatened of all cetacean species. So there's an urgent need to be active and to help. And we have learned that in situ conservation didn't work properly because the Baiji, this is the Chinese river dolphin. We lost this species in 2017, and uh, 2007. Today is declared, declared as functional extinct. The next one is the vaquita, the species on the verge of extinction. And uh, we lost 95% of the whole population within 25 years. Today we have perhaps nine, 10 animals left. And here, um, a species that is closely related to the species that we saw yesterday here in Zoo Marine. This is the uh, Hefireus Tursiops, um, Truncatus Hefireus. Claudia already mentioned it, where we have only six animal, 600 animals left, less than the people that are here in the audience. So this is something that we have to keep in mind and where we have to work and do something do something. And we started in 19, uh, 2018 with the ESOC workshop that we organized in Nuremberg. And, um, and this um, workshop was designed in order to uh, see to what extent exit management can, can prevent further extinction, how we can help with extinct, uh, with uh, exit management. And um, we used as a conservation framework the one plan approach. We are pretty convinced that this is the best framework that you can have because it's, and this is where, where, where we have, to, where, what we have to keep in mind, we have to strengthen, we have to intensify our ex situ efforts. We have to do a little more in, in situ um, conservation. But on the other hand, we also have to intensify our ex situ work and we have to put all the people that are um, important on the same table. So this is stakeholder involvement. So we are very, very con uh, convinced 
that this is the framework that will guide us in the next in decades to help uh, small cetaceans. And um, one area where zoos and aquaria can play a very, very important role is ex situ research. And we start with basic research. And uh, when we talk about protecting species, it's very important to see how these species perceive the world. And, uh, and I think there are only few zoo animal species where we know so much about the biology of the species, only based on the experience on, in having these animals under human care. And all what we know about ecolocation, or what we know about vision, that's all what we learned from zoos and aquarium. And on the right side, you see a, a picture of one of our dolphins in Nuremberg. We just finalized a project on electroperception in bottle nose dolphin. We proved that these animals are capable of perceiving electric stimuli. But also about cognition, about behavior, physiology. And in order to do all these experiments, we need one thing. And you have seen that yesterday at Zoo Marine. These animals were very, very well trained. I have seldom seen so wonderful animals. And this is the basis and the fundament and the foundation for um, cognitive studies, but also on uh, studies on sensory systems. And then we have applied research, which is also very, very important. Our vets, they gained so much knowledge in the last decades. And this is what we call conservation medicine. And we have, I think, everyone who deals with wildlife knows what the capture myopathy is. And uh, there are so many information gaps that we have to cover. And therefore, we need the animals in our park and to run these uh, research studies. Once the animal, we have an increase number of live stranded animals. And this is where we need rehabilitation. We need proper rehabilitation protocols and once we learn how to rehabilitate the animal, then we have to manage this animal. And this is, if there is one people that can do that, this is the zoo vets and the zoo biologist. And the last but not least, once you, the animal is safe, you have to look for temporary uh, places to locate the animals or for long-term housing how we call it, sometimes they call it differently. On the right side, you see the temporary um, um, floating pen that was designed for the vaquitas. Unfortunately, it didn't uh, go well with that, but this is a little bit where we can provide a lot of know-how. In 2017, we tried to capture, finally, we tried to capture the last vaquitas in order to place them, to remove them from the, from the natural habitat and to place them into a safe environment. It didn't work out because of the capture myopathy. But that doesn't mean that that doesn't work with other cetacean species. And you see here, the, it was soon after we lost the Baiji that Wang Ding and his colleagues captured the young Cephilis porpoises. And at this time there were 1,500 animals left in the Yangtze River. And they just caught 15, 16 of these animals and they put them in a protected semi-natural area. And this was Oxbow management. You see in one Oxbow management how the population increased. Today we have in three different Oxbow management, we have more than 160 animals. So it means it works. So for some species is that the option if we want to safeguard these species. Ex situ support, and uh, this is something very important. If in many countries where these animals are living, there is no, the people are not well trained in, and they don't have the possibility to get this training. So it means we can provide them with the knowledge they need. Capacity building in Pakistan and South America, this is something what we are implementing and what we are encouraging a lot of other institutions as well. Uh, here you see Maria Jimena Valderrama from Fundación Omacha who visited Randy Wells some, um, uh, yes, this year. 
So the other thing, as I said, we have an increase of live stranded animals. And if it's a threatened species, every single individual is very, very important. And this is the case of the Franciscana dolphin, one of the most threatened species in South America. And uh, here we developed scientific-based uh, rehabilitation protocols. We published already the for neonates. We are working on the juveniles. We are working on the adults. And we are trying, you know, to use these protocols in the future to save these um, uh, stranded animals. But as we finished ESOC meeting, one of the target species that urgently need help is this one, is these guys, the Atlantic humpback dolphin. And there are only maximum 3,000 anima, 3, animals left. And we, the zoo and aquarium community, provided the money to create a consortium for the conservation of these species. But more important, we worked on the short and medium term priority actions to, for the conservation of these species. So it's the roadmap for the next 10 years, what you have to do if you want to keep these species alive. And then I think we, Claudia talked about that. I already mentioned that as well. This is the Turcius Runcatus hefireus. And uh, here we are also actively working on different projects. One is about uh, Biomdans estimations and how the population is changing over time. That's where we are doing that for more than 20 years. And uh, one thing, as you see the photos on the right side, you will see the skin lesions that we are observing. There is an increase of skin lesions in many populations and local population. And I think, and this is the reason why we started this One Health project and uh, that involves targeted studies to evaluate the health, not only of the animal, but also of the habitat. And all that together brought us to the idea to propose to make out of this uh, Tursio truncatus hefireus an EP, even if we will never keep this species in European uh, zoos or aquaria. But I think there is so much thing that we can provide and that we can help for the, uh, for the conservation of the species that it makes sense. So in summary, we have insurance population restoration, young Finless purpose showed that it's possible. We have temporary rescue. We, had, we have tried that with the Wakita, but we are pretty sure that in the near in the next decades, we will have more species that need the, this help. Research capacity building, I showed you some examples. I think it's very important. Conservation education, the basis, you know, to inform the people. And this is where we zoos are very, very good. And last but not least, conservation without money doesn't work. So it means we need to encourage everyone to work and to, to raise funds. And as I said at the beginning, this is what we are providing, is what I'm telling you is the potential that we, we have, but believe me, it is a need, not a, only a potential, we have to do it. So thank you very much. Can I then? Yesterday I had beer and wine, but I don't know why they gave only water. And you're an excellent dancer as well, we saw, Lorenzo. Uh, thank you uh, for that uh, inspiring presentation. And uh, I think in that last sentence, Lorenzo, you were, you were also referring not only to the potential and the need, but also the importance of financing it. And I know you're one of these champions fighting very hard for this model, which is following the one-pen approach. But we really need to have uh, more institutions that are interested to do so, to step up and support Lorenzo in this uh, yeah, in this uh, quest to, to help save these species uh, following the integrated approach that we also promote in our population management structures. All right, uh, moving on to the last speaker in the first session, part of this session, um, Zhao Neves. Uh, Zhao will move us to um, uh, a focus on education uh, uh, and, of course, also with a focus on marine mammals. Uh, Zhao, where are you? There you are. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> Hello, everyone. 
I know that there's another João Neves around there, anywhere. So hi to João. Anyway, I just met, I just realized that there's another person with my, my name. So guys, uh, it ain't what you don't know, but I'm gonna tell you. Uh, I'm gonna do a short note on conservation education uh, and marine mammals, obviously, but I will try to pick your brains throughout uh, this short presentation, okay? So as you all know, animals, are emotional triggers for all of us. So we may like or, or dislike some of the animals uh, at your zoos and whatever. Uh, and you also know that different animals will provoke different feelings. Uh, and there's different emotions, avoidance emotions, approach emotions, considering the animals closer to us being mammals, not being mammals and so forth. This is all uh, not news to you, so moving on. Uh, but apart from those innate characteristics that we have towards animals, uh, we also have inbuilt quick learning programs. And this is something that is from our evolution, our evolution standpoint, from the evolution standpoint, all of us have. And it gives us like an immediate ability to learn, to see if there's danger and so forth. So I'm just going to show you a little picture over, here, over there. And I'm going to ask you guys to see where the snake is. And I'm quite sure that by now you've spotted the snake, yes? Yeah? Okay, so you spotted the snake. Now I'm gonna tell you there's not one snake there. There are four snakes there, okay? Four, I'm gonna highlight them. So now you know that there are four snakes there. Look closely, because I'm gonna show you afterwards what is this for, okay? So remember that you guys all, as humans, have inbuilt programs that are really fast and we learn with them, okay? This is almost a survival mode for all of us. So, and animals are also perceived as social objects. And this means that we look at animals and tend to see animals with human feelings, okay? So being social animals means exactly that we can look at, at the animals and can put human feelings there. And we did some research, a recent research, that proved this same uh, thing that I'm talking now, and we found that human feature, features are assigned to dolphins. This was asked before people going to the marine, so we asked them to recollect uh, what they thought about the dolphins and so forth, and this is what we got. So if you look carefully to that image, you will see that there's intelligence there, there's cleverness there, there's friendliness there. This is all human traits. This is not animal traits, okay? You can call it whatever you want, but this is human traits, for sure. And then we did a second study. We did a second study, and we found that dolphins are categorized as belonging to the protective stereotype. And what, is this mean? what does this mean? This means that dolphins, uh, this is not related to our visitors. This study was not done to our visitors, okay? Uh, but we found that dolphins, I don't know if this points, but you can see over there the, the, the round dot, uh, the round uh, mark uh, shows where the dolphin is. That place is the sweet spot for all of us. That sweet spot is where we put our family and our closest friends and our pets, Okay, so that spot over there is the spot that we need to protect as we all want to protect our children and our family. Dolphins stick right in there, okay? So we know that dolphins have some features, although we may not understand them immediately, but dolphins do have some features that we connect really easy to them. One of them is obviously being mammals. So, and they also, and marine mammals, but let's talk about humans first, because education is about humans. Um, there are also close kinships. Uh, and a recent study showed that implicit characteristics will affect our predisposition to learn and to adapt behaviors. If you look, if you pay attention to the, to the image over there, you'll see that the primates and the mammals, primates are uh, showing, and the rats and so forth, are, uh, those are the mammals, obviously, and empathy scores and compassion scores are way up when you consider mammals. This is, all, this is not new for you, I know, guys, but I'm just, bear with me, okay? Uh, so, uh, as close as genetically to us, we will feel more connected to them, we will engage 
more easily with those animals. If I want to, to design a conservation, pro, a conservation stra education strategy for a star, uh, starfish, look, the starfish is way below there, the compassion and empathy scores, it would be not the same as doing one for the mammals which are up there. And also, uh, on this close kinships, there are multiple dimensions at work here. And pay attention that these multiple dimensions are cross-cultural, okay? So we're all multicultural here, and this one, that all, this three that I'm going to show you, all, we all share the same, okay? One is charisma. We all know charismatic species, this, that this is why we use charismatic species as flagship species for conservation projects and campaigns and so forth. Phylogenetic closeness, just like I told you, and neotenic traits. For those of you who don't, do not know what neotenic traits, which I guess you all know, it's the retainment of infantile characteristics uh, in the adult uh, stages of life. If you pay attention to the panda bear, uh, we know that there's, uh, the eyes are just uh, small dots over there, but to a children, the eyes are the black, round, big dots, so they have big eyes, large heads, and so forth. So they do retain some infantile characteristics. And the role of conservation education is fundamental, just like uh, uh, it has been said just, just right now. Uh, uh, there is an increasing amount of evidence nowadays, not enough, but there is an increasing amount of evidence uh, supporting education as a promoter of attitude shift. This is not uh, the full spectrum of attitude shift, but it, it's better than nothing. So there, there are evidence uh, surfacing uh, that will tell us that education, uh, conservation education in particular, they're promoting attitude shifts. And what this means, this means that our minds can talk to our hearts or our minds can talk to our visitors' minds, visitors' hearts. That's the most important thing when we're talking about education. And education, just like yesterday I said, uh, for those of you who were there, education is not possible without communication. And all, as you all know in this room, uh, communication, it has devil in its details. Okay, so you all know we all had issues with communication, with miscommunication, so the devil is in the details when talking about communication. So, for the past 10 years, I would say, a little bit more than 10 years, but let's go for the last decade, uh, the things have been, have been changing and we've been moving away, the, commu the zoological community in general, have been moving away from simple problem-solving messaging. So, this animal is in danger, let's do something about that. So, the focus is, the, fo the first focus is negative. So, this is a problem, let's solve it. To a different flip. Now, we're talking about using the, the conservation communication, using the marketing strategies, some of the updated marketing strategies, which is putting a positive note in whatever you want to educate, whatever uh, program and species you want to educate about, okay? So, for a long time, marketing has been using uh, techniques to engage consumers. Now it's our time. Not consumers, but visitors changing their behavior. And now we're at this, at this point. We don't want to sell what's knowledge. We want to sell attitudes, okay? The sell is obviously, we don't want to sell anything, but we want to sell them, to engage them in the why. Why should we protect these animals? So, uh, touching base with the attitudes. And uh, we need to pay attention to the next coming uh, generations, adult generations coming to zoos, okay? So, the millennials are already there, but the Gen Zs are really young, Yet, they're the, one, the children visiting us, some of them, but they will turn adults and they will, may not opt for visiting us if, if, we don't, if we don't follow suit and we don't understand what they want. Okay, pay attention to the third line and you'll see that there's uh, something that we should all be thinking thoroughly about, which is the average attention span has dropped from 12 seconds to 8 seconds seconds, okay? And the next one, the generation Y, I don't know if it's called like this, I guess it's the Y. Um, I don't know how many seconds will it be, five? I don't know. 
but it's something that we should be thinking about. And then there's the anthropomorphism. I know that this, this is a big word for all of you, but I'm talking about uh, anthropomorphism, and this is to pick your brains. Okay, guys? Uh, anthropomorphism, education focused. I'm not talking about doing presentations, anthropomorphic presentations. No, I'm not doing, not talking about that. I'm talking about using specific tools, anthropomorphic tools with education, within education strategies to test if there's any attitudinal response. This is a complex cultural and emotional phenomenon, we all know, but I, I have a word for you guys. Disney, okay? Disney works best. And Disney puts, can put um, a piece of metal like that, uh, like a, um, a square piece of metal like that, with all the human emotions in it. And that's anthropomorphism. And if you've seen this movie, which I guess all of you have seen this movie, you know that you've, this movie has all the range of emotion, of human emotions in there with a piece of metal, okay? So Disney rocks. And then there's marine mammals. They are also uh, frequent targets of anthropomorphism. And some of the issues that I, I, I'm quite sure that you all know by now, forward-facing eyes, just like myself, head separated from the body, just like myself, upright posture, just like myself, Big eyes, like, just like you guys, not myself. I used to be like that. I'm not there, <laughs> that anymore. Uh, so these are some of the traits that you can use using anthropomorphism. And by the way, I don't know if you know, but anthropomorphism, recent evidence have been showing that, and there's a, if you look at down there, you can check that, that research, that review paper. Recent evidence shows that there's a positive influence in pro-environmental attitudes and behaviors, guess what? Using anthropomorphism. But anthropomorphism has one defect, which is it's not a solid scientific, it does not have a yet a solid scientific background. So it's not clearly studied yet. And we usually base our decisions in false psychology, like I'm a biologist, I should be teaching about the animal with all the encyclopedic knowledge, I shouldn't be using other tools, but most and foremost, we need to engage them. So that's why I'm bringing this issue of anthropomorphism, just to pick your brains, okay? Again, mind the details, I'm talking about uh, communication. So mind the details, I don't know if you realized before, but Disney movies and princess Disney movies have all princesses has, have perfectly brown and straight teeth. There's no uh, princess with, with bad teeth, okay? Because there's no danger with, with uh, uh, princesses. And Disney goes one step above and uh, uses a monster, which is one single head, okay? So one head, it doesn't detach from the body. It's only one head. It's one eye only. And the teeth may be a little bit pointy, but they're round, so no danger there. I'm going to show you the opposite from Disney as well, but using more... Um, in, uh, more, cre uh, cre cre what, more biological information. Sharp teeth, what's the emotion going into the children? It's danger. So using some of the details, I'm just wrapping up, uh, uh, is something that we should be addressing also. We're still short on evidence. One uh, short sentence for, for you guys. Shortness of evidence does not equal lack of evidence, okay? So zoos do need to invest more in social science research to base, to like give more groundwork to education. And we need to walk the talk. What we've been doing at Zoomarine, uh, and I'm not gonna go through this, you can contact me afterwards. The current lines of research, education-wise, uh, wise, uh, uh, for the, uh, like the recent years now at Zoomarine, we've been doing something like this. Uh, not at all, not all of them are related to marine mammals, obviously, but they're all uh, related to conservation education, okay? So you can talk to me after this if you're interested, okay? I need to move on. And going back to the first slide, it ain't what you don't know, guys, but I'm gonna give you one more information that gets you into trouble. Is what you know for sure that just ain't so, and this is not my words, okay? And to wrap up, Guys, we only, uh, only understanding and adapting the drive dynamics that work behind the zoo visitors' motivations can take us to the next level. We must play the game winning hearts before reason. This is 
the key aspect in my opinion. Education strategies are important only if we can harness our audience's attention. This is knowing our attention, our uh, audience. We need to study them. And marine mammals do have positive intrinsic characteristics, but good looks can take you only so, can only take you so far. So we need to keep on working more with marine mammals, but not only with marine mammals. They all need our help. So guys, uh, this is my last slide. Look at the snakes over there. I'm quite sure that you guys can all see the four snakes. So congratulations. You're using your recent gained information from your inbuilt system. It's yours to keep. And in that square over there, that QR code, if you want to read some of the papers that I've mentioned, uh, just uh, scan that and there's a folder with, uh, present, with the papers that I've just mentioned. Okay, guys, thank you. Thank you, Zhao. Some excellent food for thought in that presentation. Um, I'm just thinking about this, this Generation Z and then having to listen to a, a presentation, uh, a, a session of two hours. It's painful, perhaps. Anyway, uh, we're going to move on to the second part of the session, as I said, but not before thanking um, my colleague Meryl from the office, who really did a lot of work in coordinating this session, getting together, and also one more round of applause for all the speakers in this first hour. And with that, I'm going to uh, invite Anna on the stage, as well as also already all the panelists. If the panelists can take their seats on stage, then Anna will take over from here. Thank you. It's yours. Well, good afternoon. Thank you so much for you to be here. Thank you for so much for the invitation to be here uh, today. Um, thank you for allowing me to learn a little bit more about your work, about what you do, the amazing work that you develop. So just um, let me say thank you for the work you do in protecting our planet, in protecting our biodiversity. Thank you. Well, the management and care of marine mammals is a subject that uh, generates a lot of controversy even inside your community. But uh, we can be talking right now about cetaceans, but we can also bring into this discussion, for example, other animals like elephants or primates or birds or sharks or manta rays. And there are uh, voices demanding that zoos and aquariums should be shutting down. Uh, as um, a few of you know, I was here during the conference uh, recording some interviews for a new TV show for the radio and television of Portugal. Uh, for those that I didn't have the chance to schedule an interview, please, uh, we will do that soon. So <laughs> we will stay in, uh, in touch. And the team that was with me working here is a very, very young team. And uh, they also are producing the most important environment TV show here in Portugal. And um, they visited a zoo, a park, just two days ago. And uh, why, you ask? Well, I think you know all the, the, the answer, I'm, I'm sure of it, um, they thought that the animals in zoos and parks are only for display. So what has been happening in those last few days was something amazing. They were knowing a little bit more your work, knowing a little bit more what, you are, what are you doing, and they are now amazed <laughs> with the work you do and you develop. They changed their minds. So. Congratulations, because you conquered not only more visitors, but also 
ambassadors. And this brings us to the topic of this conversation, the future of zoos and aquariums, challenges, opportunities for progressive zoos and aquariums, of course. And for this conversation, I have five top experts. Antonieta Costa, head of educational department of the Lisbon Zoo, Portugal, chair of EASA Conservation Education Committee, I also have with me Andre Papp, Vice Director of Zoology at Sosto Zoo, Hungary, he has a chair. And Eric Bayron Ruivo, Science and Converse Conservation Director at the Bouval Zoo, France, Chair of EASA Conservation Community. João Falcato, CEO do Oceanário de Lisboa, Portugal, Aquarium Representative at, uh, in EASA Council. And, uh, well, that couldn't be with us today. He's not feeling very well, but we have Lorenzo Vornfersen that you met uh, a few uh, minutes uh, ago. Well, I could uh, start this conversation by asking uh, these uh, guests, why are the reasons there are keep, that we are keeping animals in zoos and aquariums today? I believe the answer uh, was, well, for uh, protection, conservation, and also education. But this is a message that is easy to transmit when you are talking about emblematic species, I think. But what about when those species that are not so glamorous or not so sexy how do you manage this? How do you balance this? Maybe Antonieta <laughs> could be the first? Well, empathy uh, is uh, nowadays is a powerful uh, currency. So we have to, to work on this. Uh, and like uh, João, uh, like to João's talk uh, before, we, uh, emotions are very, very important. So we do have to work uh, more on this and uh, also to be more transparent in our work is I, I think it's the, the, the reason so and put, because we have to put uh, to pull pe uh, people to action because uh, nowadays uh, it's not only about raising awareness because every, everybody uh, knows facts uh, facts is, they, they are easy to, to get but uh, to get emotional it's not so easy so zoos have to work on that part and uh, fortunately, we had this uh, converse, uh, uh, talk, uh, wonderful talk, uh, João. And uh, I can give an example that happens to me this morning. I was in my room working, um, and the cleaning lady just knocked at the door and to, to clean. And I said, "Okay, sorry, but I'm working. Uh, uh, please not." So, oh, you are in the in the in the group. Oh. I'm so happy that you are here and so happy for your work because it makes a difference. And that makes me, okay, wow. And it was really a difference. João, could you tell us about your experience at Oceanario? Well, uh, thinking a, a little bit of the broader uh, picture of, of will there be aquariums in 30 years, 40 years, like, like, like the challenge, I think uh, we cannot give an answer, obviously. We don't know what will happen in five years. Will there be a Google in 30 years? Nobody can say that, that there will be. So, so for sure, the future is completely uncertain. That's what we know. But we also know what are the trends. We also know that we are putting one billion people on this planet every 13 years. So we do know that cities will be a lot bigger in the future. We do know that people will be more away from nature in the future. And, and we no, do know the power of emotions, of contacting with animals. So if there will be a future of, of, of aquariums and zoos in 30 years, I think we need to understand what will make the difference. And I think what will make the difference is all of us. It's what we do. It's actually not what's around us. Uh, Google will exist or not, depending on the competence of the people that work in Google to adapt to society. And that's what, what we will have to do. How can we become relevant? How will we be important for society to exist? I think that's what we are always debating here. 
Is it conservation? Is it emotions? Is it making people contact with nature that is so, so needed? We know the value of natural capital. It's going scarcer and scarcer. We know um, the green movement is here. We need to walk the talk on that regard as well. We know so many things. And for us to be relevant, I think it will be different for aquarium, for a zoo, for a big, for a small, for a dolphin arm. It's just we really need to define a strategy that society feels and nature feels that we are needed. So, so that's what we need to decide. Andre, I would like to hear you about this too. Yes, I would, I would like to just uh, continue this, this line of thinking. I think that uh, diversifying the experience in the zoos, that's what which makes me able to survive. So um, today the, the, the human society, the culture is lo losing elements. So some, some kind which is not important anymore is actually forgotten. And uh, it may happen with the zoos that with the focus on conservation uh, would make the zoos less favored and, and uh, less viable in the future. But if we diversify the uh, experience and we find the elements which are still important for the society, uh, that makes us stronger. And that's a very important element of the work of the ads as well, uh, because we can diversify the, the experience by joining uh, forces and, and uh, finding the diversity within our community and, and getting everything together and sharing this experience with all the zoos who belong to the community. Well, conservation is one of the bases, I believe, of your, of your work here. Um, and I would ask the help of Eric and Lorenzo for this. I believe it's easy to find finance, for example, for um, conservation projects uh, in situ. I don't know if, it's, if it is that easy to find finance for um, conservation projects uh, ex situ, for example, reproductive uh, programs of some, of some species. Um, how do you find the means and the tools to do this work? Definitely, definitely not easy. <laughs> uh, effectively, the, the flag species attract a lot of money, but... Uh, Zoos have the capacity to work with almost everything, even cetaceans. And um, uh, I think it, we are in a crucial moment of where all the frame, biodiversity framework is changing and we were not able to save the planet until now and we have a last opportunity to do it. And what I think that zoos have to do is to really to think about what will be their role in this conservation. It is not only financial, because many conservation can be done with very little funds. And uh, during this uh, conference, it was amazing to see how small zoos across Europe are able to carry on incredible conservation program for species that nobody knows or little knows, like the grouse hopper or uh, the pine vole or things like that. So we have a tremendous power in terms of human resources. Sometimes of financial resources. I remember that uh, uh, WASA made a study a few years ago about uh, the contribution of zoos, to co financial contributions of zoos to conservation, and we found out that apart from the governmental entities, we com uh, the common zoos and aquariums together were the third contributed for financial contributed for conservation. But another thing that I think is important to 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 think and I uh, to, uh, to have in mind and. Uh, that's something that from Lorenzo's presentation came to my mind. It was um, uh, a sentence said by Dan Hash, which was a former AZA uh, director, that made an article with a title that always made me think. He's, what is the immeasurable distance between late and too late? And that means that we have to prevent extinctions. We have to prevent everything. And zoos are very well positioned to do that jump, that conservation, that, that work. And so we have responsibilities for the animals we keep, but we also have responsibilities for the animals that we do not keep. Vaquita del Mar was uh, one of the examples. Uh, we can think about Saola, we can think about uh, the giant um, soft shell turtle, etc. So, yes, it is the time for us 
and the EASA campaign 21 plus is part of this, of his thinking. Where are we going? What has to be our, our future in terms of conservation? And we also, just for remember everybody, we might have soon new field, con uh, fi uh, new field uh, standards for conservation, which will also help people to, uh, and institutions, zoos and aquariums to do more, even more than that. Lorenzo? Um, yeah, one p I, I remember yesterday as I went to the conservation committee meeting, I never knew that there is a grasshopper in the gra grau or something, it's the French name. And uh, I was really amazed about this work and uh, I think it's a wonderful example how to show that uh, zoos can give even, I wouldn't say ugly animals, but not so sexy, a, a voice in the face. And, uh, and I think an NGO that is devoted for the protection of the grau grasshopper, they will have a lot of problems, you know, to raise funds. And uh, a zoo, and uh, I, I found the presentation that you gave, I don't know if they are in the audience, you know, but wonderful, because there was a lot of creativity. So we have the potential, even if we don't touch the herd immediately, like it was yesterday with the dolphins at uh, Zoo Marine. But we have the potential with creativity and with ideas, you know, to touch the heart. At least the grau grasshopper touched my heart and I, I'm sure that I will visit this animal in the near future. And, uh, and this is, I think, one of the most powerful tools that we have in zoos, that even for the smallest animal, even for the most ugliest animal, we have a chance to make this animal now to the public so that start with educational campaign a little bit what, what he was saying. And, uh, and I think this is, this is one of our tasks, you know, because it's very easy for a vaquita because they look very, very nice, sexy, and you know, with these very nice eyes and so on. It's very nice if you go and you ask 100 people, let's save the vaquita. Every 100 people will give you the money, you know, because it has this, all these elements that uh, Joao was saying about, uh, I don't know, this Kintian schema, uh, there's a little bit what Conrad Lawrence once uh, de uh, defined as all these characters with the big eyes and so on. But for a grasshopper, that's very difficult. And this is where we are and where we can jump in. There are no ugly animals. <laughs> <laughs> Antonia, do you agree? Always uh, um, work on the heart zone. It's not only hand zone or um, mind zone. Uh, only uh, knowledge, but we have to to create emotion. We have to work heart zone. It's a heart zone connection. So uh, we really, for example, but uh, it's not all about fundings. Uh, we can reach people uh, even outside of the zoo world, uh, inside of the zoo walls. Sorry. Um, uh, for example, um, I can give you two examples inside of the zoo and outside of the zoo. Um, for example, in these pandemic times, um, uh, Lisbon Zoo and Zagreb Zoo uh, collaborated um, online. Uh, so Zagreb uh, has um, uh, an event uh, annually uh, with uh, uh, the uh, Australian embassy, uh, embassy uh, about uh, um, uh, animals in Australia. Uh, and but they don't have koalas, so and we do have it in in Lisbon. So uh, we joined, and we in Lisbon we gave uh, we we program we had a program a conservation education programs for them, uh, a live online uh, where uh, where uh, the the visitors uh, interact with our zoo educator near the koalas facility. And even today, my colleague told me that uh, uh, the participants uh, who were there uh, asked for more of these. So it's, it, it's not only um, uh, uh, in the walls, but outside we can do uh, lots of things. For example, Lisbon Zoo um, is a partner of uh, Microsoft Education for many years, and uh, we have programs for all over the world. 
uh, in the, the Skype in the classroom program. And we reach students and, uh, and uh, p uh, teachers all over the world. And we, we, the, when the, we the pandemic came, it was really easy to, to connect with the public. But I can uh, give another example. We have the Zoo Nature Club. Uh, and we work with, uh, uh, with our uh, neighbors, with, with families that live, for example, in, the, uh, in, the local, in our local parish council in São Domingos de Benfica. Uh, we started before the pandemic uh, and we worked, uh, well, it was not only raising awareness, <coughs> but li like I said before, uh, was connecting people uh, into, into nature. So, we had a, a special special uh, activities during a, a full year, and we connect families. But pandemic came, we transformed that program online and online for all public all uh, families in Portugal, and we gathered 700 families, uh, and it was really fantastic. We used the uh, connect, understand, uh, and act. Uh, methodology uh, that is a, a social uh, marketing methodology to uh, to push people into action and really uh, and we have uh, uh, surveys that confirm the effectiveness of this kind of programs not only uh, local not only inside the zoos outside uh, but outside of the zoo walls or even online did you also feel this need to reinvent yourselves during the pandemic when your facilities were closed to the public, for example, Andrea? Yes, in a manner, but I think that during the pandemic, uh, however, the, the work changed a lot. Uh, the, the interest uh, of the public didn't really change, so it wasn't, this wasn't uh, a critical time, so that we cannot restart again almost with the same activities. And uh, as well, the strength of ours is that we can activate and trigger activities immediately without own resources because we are sharing. We are uh, actually wired to be uh, competitive, but wired to be uh, working in a, in, a, in a community. So sharing experiences. We have the forums, we have the venues to talk about it. And even if we couldn't meet in person, but online, we have shared experience, we have shared knowledges. We even improved uh, or, or uh, standards. And uh, we can we can actually pull up everything from a basket I immediately if someone is in a need. So that's that's amazing in this in this association in this community that zoos are not working alone, but th this is a network which is which is covering a huge geographical area and uh, every aspects of the of the modern progressive zoos activities. And we can source out everything uh, piece by piece if you want. Sure. Well, I, I think reinventing, like you mentioned, is probably the key world. Uh, I don't know if there will be zoos in 30 years, but I really feel that in 30 years, the zoos will not be like, like they are today, for sure. That's, I think that's a given fact. In 30 years, everything will be different. How it, will it be? We don't really know. It's what we're working on. And, and, and the pandemic gave us a perfect example. We really had to reinvent ourselves, do things in a different way, look at other opportunities. In our case, we even thought how our activity could be changed, and, and we did change in some ways. We, we all thought ourselves as an aquarium that did conservation and that brought people from the city in, into contact with the underwater world, the beauty that nobody normally sees. Uh, during the pandemic, we, we, we rethought what our activity was. So we understood that it could be putting humans in contact with nature as, a, as an activity. <clears throat> and it could also be done in other places. We have quite unique know-hows that not many other institutions have. And I think we always have to look for this. What are we different? What are a uniqueness? What are we different from universities? What are we different from NGOs? Because these are the things that will take us apart. So education, I believe, it's one of the assets uh, that we have uh, that we can use. So, so we started picking other companies that are working, observing dolphins, for example, raising their experience, putting a brand name of Oceanario, and you have a new product 
<coughs> in brackets, that's not dependent on a building where you cannot go in because COVID is around. So for sure, I think that's something all of us will need to be doing in the future, reinventing ourselves. Uh, conservation is clearly what I believe the future will be, that where we can be very relevant because we have unique know-hows and new facilities, unique uh, capabilities that allow us to be more efficient than many other organizations. So we can be relevant here if we move forward. But will it be like we are doing today? I don't believe so. We really need to start rethinking, rethinking, because in 30, uh, 30 years we will be different. Everybody will. We as well. Do you feel that public opinion opinion is um, influences the future of the zoos and um, I don't know could it be the other way zoos and aquariums influencing the public opinion I don't know who wants to go first Eric I would just jump on what uh, what um, uh, João said João says it's talking a lot about the future which is important but I would like to, to talk about the present because I don't know the present. We, collect, we don't know today what we collectively we do. I was surprised at the, the Conservation Forum in Zagreb or at the Conservation Committee tomorrow to see all these programs coming in that nobody heard about. We talk about plenty of them. Today, we only know as a conservation committee, 40% of the conservation activities of our members. So how can we be credible outside if we cannot even know what we do? It's a some question that I ask to all of you. It is so important that we know exactly what, why, what, are we, what we are doing, what are our capacities, what are the, 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 the locals where we work, the species with whom we work, because we do not know them. And I think that's really important not only for the perception of the people towards what we do but also the perceptions of all partners of the people what, that we need to, to work so again i ask you all it is important for you to enter your programs into the database to let us know what you're doing they, because i'm sure that you, we are doing much more than we think that we are much more important and vital for the conservation of the world that we think but we, do, we really do not know yet. And that is for me essential that we start by knowing what we are really doing. This is not about what uh, just Eric was saying, but this is about reinventing the wheel, the wheel and about the pandemic. And, uh, and I realized during the pandemic, we had to reinvent, I don't know, we had to do something because a zoo was like a television or a cinema. And I strongly believe that, um, that we will, one thing is a constant, and this was 200 years ago, and this is today. The people like to see wildlife. And uh, I don't know, Edward Wilson, one invented uh, the biophilia hypothesis, you know, that we have an innate, you know, tendency to for nature for nature for a plant for i don't know if you're living in in, in a building new york and the i don't know and the hundreds floor you know you will have a small fish you know in your aquarium or you have a plant or whatever so this is a natural tendency and this is the driving force and this is i think the most important i th the unique selling uh, i don't know what it is um of the zoo we are selling life and the main point is to change that in a way that the people believe that the animal is feeling okay, that the animal is feeling well and all that. And I think this is the, the basis. And on top of that, we can put a lot of other things. We can put the research because it's needed. This is what we need. Uh, we have to put um, a conservation, we have to put education. But I think the most important thing, you know, is to present the animal, and this is aesthetic, you know. If we are going to talk about emotions, and yesterday, I don't know, was, uh, Elio was saying, uh, the, uh, touching the heart, and uh, as they finished the uh, uh, dolphin presentation, you know, I said this was 
beautiful, you know, this was like a piece of art, you know, with all, with all the trainers, you know, that I'm right, with the dolphin. It was very, very nice. And uh, you don't have to comment that, you know. And this is, I think, something. And if we want to show a grasshopper or a snake or whatever, it, we have to work on the aesthetic, on something that's nice, so that the people want to see it, want to come to visit us again, and then they will put money for conservation research and all this stuff. So, do you feel that public opinion is defining the future of zoos and aquariums? I believe this has... <laughs> is uh, very close to what Lorenzo and Eric just said. Antonia, do you feel that? Well, we, we, we are the most critical uh, for ourselves. So, but we really need to be more social, to be more transparent. For example, webcams uh, in the zoo or in the wild, uh, to, to, to really get people's emotions and to, to catch their, their attention. So I think we should invest on that and to be transparent because we, we don't have to be afraid of public opinion because we, we do a, a great, great work. Why? Why do, I, do we fear? So, no, show ourselves and show our wonderful work and um, we have all the transparency in favour of us because what we need is action. And if we don't uh, show ourselves, and if you don't uh, show the world what we do, for example, your, your people didn't knew nothing about zoos. Why? It's our fault. Sorry, but it's our fault. We need to work on that. Do you agree, Andre? Um, I'm not afraid that we are able to do that. And why I'm saying that is that I see a pattern in the association which is similar to the biology. So with genetic diversity, the animals are able to resist the ecological shifts. So if we are a system, an ecosystem like NEASA, the, the most networking, the most collaboration we have in the most diverse community, we have the largest genetic diversities. And, and uh, if the society is the, the surrounding environment, the changes are coming from there and we are able to, to respond them because we have uh, many resources to take examples from. So I think that this association, this network, this collaboration is strengthening us. Joao? Well, I, I think first we, we need to define a little bit what public opinion means, right? Uh, and, and I think there are two parts. One is the general public and, and to be sincere and this gut feeling, no no facts that are our scientific data. When we look at the numbers of visitors of aquariums and zoos, they are going up always. So I don't think we really have a problem. What we have now is a group of people that really does not agree with our activity. Is that good or is that bad? I don't think there is any activity developed by humans that does not have some group that does not like it and that thinks it should not be that way. And I actually believe it's good because what it makes us, what it, the impact is we will look at what we are doing and how we are doing it in a more precise way. So what they're doing to us is making us improve and do more quicker. Is that bad? No. We are in such an urgent situation that the, the faster we go, the better. And if we, ha if, we have, if we have pressure, I think even better. Then when we look at the rest, uh, do we have an impact? Well, we did a study a few years ago where we understood that our impact is actually quite big. Right? Aquariums in general in Europe have around uh, 140 million visitors every year. No, 72 million visitors every year, I'm sorry. That's 10% of the European population visits one aquarium every single year. And for two hours, they are there listening to us. And by the way, zoos, aquariums, museums are the most trusted source of information. I'm sorry, it's not media. Media is the main <laughs> source, but it's not the most trusted one. We're used to. So wh whatever, whatever we say to these people, they are ready to listen to it and believe it. That's hugely powerful. So yes, I really believe if we do a good job, we can influence the 
public opinion in relation to so many different issues. It's for us to choose them. They will also influence us, of course. If we are not listening to them, if we are like that, we don't have a future as well. So clearly this is something that needs to go both ways. And if we find the right balance, we can have a great future. If we don't, uh, I don't know. <laughs> Eric? Well, I think that we spend too much time fighting anti-Zeus <laughs> instead of doing the work. <laughs> That's one of the things. Uh, Zeus are, uh, I don't think that visitors influence where we are. I think that we are what we are, we have our jobs and we have to do, it, do them better and better and better. And tell people and the world what we are doing again, that is as, impo as important in a sense of uh, than uh, than just doing. I, I think the, the example of uh, Boval Zoo, we have a conservation foundation and we engage visitors, we engage companies, local companies and we engage on conservation. They are our, one of our main donors come from public and from companies. And so again, I think that zoos with all the aspects that we say is the, the charming of the people, the lovely animals, etc we are able to engage society in st into conservation, into uh, sustainable use of natural resources, and that's a role that we have to increase more in the future. Lorenzo? If it's, as, it, as Joao said, that the people trust in what we say, that's wonderful. <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> and uh, so it's, a, it's just a communication problem if we are having a problem, you know. I think we don't have such a big problem. We have some people that doesn't uh, agree with the way or what we, are, what we are doing, but this is a minority that are quite loud. And bueno, he, you already taught us how many million visitors are coming. And they have, if they trust in our message, then it's fine. I think this is the best basis uh, to work on all what we are doing. And that's then only just a question of communicating what we are doing. And perhaps we are not so good, you know. And uh, so this is something that we have to improve. And that, I think the other thing is what makes everything more trustable is networking. And we have seen that many, many times during all the talks and a little bit the work also of EASA, VASA, ALPSA and all these organization is networking. And in the past, we were not part of the conservation community because there was ex situ, in situ. Today we have a wonderful framework with the one plan approach. And this is so powerful. And um, I remember in, in, in Marseille, we were talking with John Paul Rodriguez from the Species Survivor Commission. And he recognized the power of zoos in just because of the 700 million people that are visiting us. And if they trust in what we are saying, then it's the future of zoo is wow, that's the best business that you can invest great news <laughs> yes Andre. yeah but very important that the trust can be only maintained with the with the excellence so with the proven and 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 uh, solid uh, um, quality we can we can offer so that's why the higher standard and and uh, the practices we are sharing with each other is the best practices are important and also uh, just turning back to the DEASA, the accreditation system, which is proven and which is securing this, that we can provide the best and offer the, the best experience for the visitors. That's very important in the system. Yeah, and I think this is what, what Daniel was saying. This is at the institutional level, all what these guys are doing in order to show the public that they care about welfare with independent inspectors and so on. I think that's, it's a wonderful example to show how we can just provide this trustable information. And I can just add, for example, we, it's not just only work uh, with uh, zoos or aquariums institutions inside, but we have to partner with other institutions outside. I can just give an example uh, uh, from, uh, from Lisbon. Uh, for example, Microsoft didn't knew anything about zoos and you just knock at the door invite them and show 
and they realize the, uh, the potential of the zoo. So let's uh, show us. And don't forget that we also can influence politics. Of course. And that is something very important. Yes, uh, we are on a good road, though. At the institution moment. and also collectively, Technology. we can influence <laughs> legislation, we can influence good practices. Uh, we have uh, many examples. We have now a palm oil application that allows to, to, to look at the source of the palm oil when you buy a product. So I remember that we made the biggest petition ever done in EU uh, regarding the bush meat, and we were able to change legislation regarding bush meat. We were able to change legislation regarding timber sources. So we have, we, we are a very powerful organization. We, when we work collectively, and when we know what we are doing. Yeah, and just <laughs> to carry this on, uh, if we want to be a strong lobby, uh, uh, we, ha we, we want to have strong uh, uh, lobby power. We need the evidences, we need the numbers, we, have, we need the best numbers and the best evidences, and we need a mass uh, to use it for the lobby. So that's where uh, the request from Eric King that we need to provide those evidences, we need to provide those uh, numbers in the databases we are collecting, and we need the representation from each and every zoo in our community to have this strong uh, lobby, lobby power. Well, yesterday we're celebrating 30 years of EASA. Congratulations. Um, if uh, you allow me, I will ask you to make, if it is possible, a kind of a balance and a kind of a trying to project the future for this association, Eric? Well, it has been all, everything for me <laughs> for almost 30 years. <laughs> I've been investing so much in, the, in this organization because I do believe in the power of working together. And that's uh, mainly that. When I, when I look at what we were when I started in EASA in 1992, and I look at what we're doing today, I think we have accomplished so much. We have done so much, so much that it's absolutely incredible. Now, my, for me, uh, sorry, I always, as we say in Portuguese, I take the sardines to my charcoal, puxada brasa minha sardinha. I'll go back. I really hope that zoos and aquariums in the future will be conservation centers, will be not only, uh, they will continue to do education, they will continue to do research and to, make this beautiful, to show the beautiful nature to the public. But we have to be even more active in conservation, in protection. I have a dream one day <laughs> that, some, that I imagine if one of each as a members would uh, manage a national park. That would be crazy, incredible what we could do. And I think that we can do this, uh, such kinds of things in 30 years see each of us managing a national park. That will be great. So, future of the nature can also rely on us. We are not the only actors, but we can be very important actors for nature in the future. As well? 30 years from now is 2050. <laughs> so my dream would be for, for nature to be in a much better situation than it is today. And we, as a group, having have a very important role in that being achieved. And even if it means we disappear, if in the end nature is here, I think that that's our mission, our goal. So conservation, I'm, I'm with Eric. We, it's only possible to be achieved if we all work together. And if, if we are now facing challenges related to a few people, I think many times it's because we've done a great job. It's because we have people looking into nature and having opinions into nature that they would never have had if zoos and aquariums did not exist for so long. So uh, I think we will have a brilliant future if we all keep working together. And one single institution has almost zero impact. But we, if we look around and the amount of people we touch, the amount of programs we have all together, the amount of animals we manage, I mean, it, it's, it's really huge and, and it, it can only grow, it can only grow. Antonieta? Well, our big community are through agents of change. 
And uh, what I see in the future is that uh, we are really achieving it. I really, uh, it's my dream uh, to, to become true agents of change. And, um, but we have to work together, even in, in our own zoos. Not only, okay, in uh, working together as a, as a, a community, but in starting our own uh, house. Also. Lorenzo, I guess I will save Andre for the la Andre for last. Sure. Lorenzo. Um, well, I agree with all what all the other colleagues said. I think we are on the on a good pathway, but we are also at a very problematic point. We are now prisoner of our, our own success. We are breeding animals like hell, and we don't know what to do. And now. And I think this is a serious problem. And I see also cultural differences, how we deal with this problem. And this, I think, th something that will keep us busy in the next decades. And uh, not only five years, there would be a lot of time, you know. And this is part of the psychology that we have to use. And, um, and the main point is, what's the right strategy? Who is right and what he is doing? And uh, I think in 100 years, somebody will tell us, okay, this party was okay, you know, this was right, you know. But at the moment, we have to use common sense because we don't know other, other strategies in order to solve this problem. And this is surplus animals. This is, I think, some of the issues that we have to, um, I don't know, at least to address. It was addressed already, but I think we have to mot put a little bit more emphasis into that because we are managing animals, not only in our zoo, but we have to manage animals also in the wild. And also there, there might be something, the solution of culling might be the only opportunity to save species. And the other thing is, I think, one, one area where we have to increase, and I like all the work that all the, the educators are doing, is what we call the human dimension in wildlife conservation. We have a lot of areas where we have wildlife, human wildlife conflicts due to the increased number of people that we have. And uh, I think when we, uh, uh, when we develop a, a, um, a conservation strategy, we have to think first about the people that are living there, and they are sometimes the cause of the problem. And, uh, and sometimes I don't see it too much. We are just animal focused. We are very biologically focused on these conflicts. And I think we need, in nowadays, I think we need social psychologists, we need marketing people, we need, I don't know, all this battery of people that are necessary to sell biodiversity as a pro product like a Coca-Cola. Andre? Uh, thank you for those thoughts. I take this as a take home message as well, as, as it, it can be meant, uh, meant in our association. Uh, my vision is that zoos and, of course, as I can be a leading actor uh, in the future, uh, as the society will evolve. I think that the most uh, exciting problem will be, as I week as well told, uh, saving biodiversity and actually keeping, restoring the environment uh, simply to something where we can lead. Again. So uh, that will be absolutely about the survival and we have the mindset and we have the structures to lead in this process. I see a very interesting dynamics in the ASA as well, that the most progressive zoos are leading the, the activities. They, they give the best examples, they are the driving force, but we have a huge mass to support these activities, to implement those activities, to act local, local and, and spread the word into a, in the global message. And also reflecting very quickly on problem, local problem, and, and spreading the word. So I think we have all the structures, all the capacity and all the mindset uh, to become a leading, leading uh, uh, stakeholder in this process. Well, we still have a few minutes, so I will ask each one of you to spend one minute, just because Eric and Lorenzo were saying that some projects, conservation projects, they didn't knew until 
these uh, past few days. So in one minute, please um, tell us about a conservation problem your institution or you are involved in. Antonieta. Um, well, Lisbon Zoo is well known about the conservation of uh, uh, the, um, the, 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 the leopard. So uh, we reintroduce, uh, uh, we are, we have here the team, uh, we reintroduce uh, leopards in, in, um, uh, in Caucaso in, and uh, we, we, it's our big, big project. But uh, uh, other species are also considered, uh, like the Iberian lynx, uh, for example. But uh, uh, that is uh, really uh, our uh, really uh, only species that is only for conservation, uh, only for education, because the, the, the two individuals that we have there um, are not for breeding. So this is our two big ones. Okay. João? I'll, instead of only one program, I, I'll, I'll say the challenge we're trying to, to, to combat in some way. Coral reefs. Coral reefs, you probably are all aware, will most likely be gone in 45, 40, 50 years due to temperature rise, pH going down. pH won't come back, forget it. It will go down, down, down. It's gone. So probably coral reefs will be gone. Uh, if they're gone, 25% of the fish species will also be gone. What can we do about it? We are getting better and better and breeding corals. We know how to breed most of the species now. We have the technique. Maybe we should work more on biobanking and cryopreservation, and we are working on that. Most of the fish, uh, marine fishes, uh, species, nobody knows how to breed, how to close the cycle. We are really focusing and having more and more resources to have protocols on how to uh, breed these species, not for the aquariums, that's not our goal. It's having the protocol that will allow us in the future, if we want to keep a species alive, to be able to. Right now we are not able because we don't know how to breed. So our goal of breeding is not for collection of oceans and aquariums, is to contribute for a future that we know will be coming. So when we know 40, 50 years ago, uh, away, uh, ahead, what What's coming, it can't be scary. It needs to be an opportunity. So we know what's coming. We need to act on it. And we are doing many things to try to contribute for, for, for this biodiversity okay. to keep existing. Lorenzo, one minute. Uh, we have a lot of projects. All are in the ASA database. <laughs> Hopefully. So, <laughs> <laughs> and, you just have to. <laughs> and certainly because of my background is Latin American aquatic mammal is very important and I already said that it's not only on the protection of species I'm, I'm trying to find solutions also for the people and this is a little bit this human dimension or human engagement this is a focus that we are giving the next I would say till I die and uh, I will work on that to convince people to live with the okay. environment and with wildlife. Okay, Andre? Uh, we are watching for the local activities. We are in a forest which was uh, uh, not well managed in the, in the, in the last decades and uh, there's an over uh, use of the, of the forest uh, have, can be seen. And also we are in a situation that we are in the, the poorest part of the country where people need local activities and we relied only the foreign, on the foreign visitors. So turning into local activities, moving the local uh, uh, communities will be our mission in the future years. Okay, one minute, Eric. I have four problems, oh but less than one minute to tell them. <laughs> so one, I have to get more money to my conservation foundation to do more and better job. Two, I have to convince the other members to enter their conservation programs into the conservation database. <laughs> Three, I have to help our members to do a better conservation. And last but not the least, 30 seconds I said, I, rem I don't forget, I forgot it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking, I'm joking. <laughs> the last and one, I want to put conservation in the heart and in the brain of this organization. Well, thank you all. Thank you for being here. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you for inviting me here. Please stay in touch. My email is this. We are going to do a second season of this new TV show.
and we would like to know your conservation projects. Thank you very much.